Okay, welcome to the uh, seventh lecture of the course uh, on cyber physical system fundamentals. Again, I'm trying to teach you embedded systems fundamentals for cyber physical system design. And again, uh, we are staying in chapter two of the companion textbook. That means that, uh, again, I will be talking about the specifications and modeling. What I'm going to present today uh, can be uh, classified according uh, to the table that we have used for the classification of the material of this chapter two. Uh, in particular, I'm going to look at uh, the next uh, row in this table. I'm going to talk about the discrete event models. In the case of uh, discrete event models, uh, we can refer to quite a number of languages. We will see that in particular we have uh, quite a number of hardware description languages uh, that are based on the discrete event model. Now for discrete event uh, modeling we need to maintain a list of uh, future events and uh, maintaining this list of uh, future events is usually very inefficient if we try to use message passing for that. So therefore, most implementations of uh, simulators using the discrete event model are based on uh, shared memory and in particular also the simulators that uh, I'm uh, mentioning, simulators for hardware description languages are based on a shared memory uh, implementation. Uh, distributed implementations, though uh, they would be feasible, are typically very inefficient. That means that the speed up doesn't really scale with the number of processors that's available there. Uh, typically, uh, the speed up is much less than the number of processors that, that we're using there. So therefore, I'm linking uh, these uh, languages uh, to this particular column. I'm linking these languages uh, to a shared memory-based implementation. Even though uh, it would be possible to add message passing as a part of the model that we are using, for example, in VHDL. Uh, so in this sense, it's uh, not uh, that easy to classify these languages with respect to uh, the correct columns here. So, uh, what is uh, discrete event modeling? Well, in discrete event modeling, we are talking about uh, discrete events. Uh, we are assuming that we have a certain list of discrete events, each of which is uh, linked to a certain time. And then we are requested to uh, take the next event, to pick the next event, uh, and uh, to perform the action that's described for that event as a result. There may be a new event uh, generated. and We do this in the order of the timestamps that is uh, associated with uh, these entries. So implementations are typically based on a queue of uh, future actions which are sorted by time because that makes uh, this uh, processing a little more efficient. And uh, then the explanation of the execution semantics is based on, on a loop, on a loop which is executed until finally we stop for some reason, for example, because we have reached the maximum amount of simulation time. And then for each entry in the loop, we fetch the next uh, entry there from the queue, which is the entry that's linked to the uh, earliest of, of any timestamps. And then we perform the function as it is listed in that uh, entry. This function may include uh, the generation of new entries uh, and uh, this uh, function may also include the assignment of new values to variables. In order to visualize this, let's look at this little example down here. We assume that there is a certain queue where we have these uh, timestamps and uh, then we have actions uh, that are linked to these entries, in this case only uh, assignments to variables. And then we are assumed to pick the next entry there from the queue and perform the function which is indicated in the very first case, the assignment of a value of 5 to this variable a. Then we will pick the next entry there. In this case, this is the assignment of a 7 to B. We pick the next entry, which is the assignment of A to C. And for the fourth entry, we will replace the old value that we have there for A. 
So in this way, we, we can execute uh, the, the model, we would always uh, pick uh, the entry that belongs to the uh, smallest uh, time, to the earliest of, of any of these times that are indicated, and then we will perform the function and possibly also generate new entries there in the queue. Now these uh, discrete event models, they are used in many different contexts. And in particular, they are used uh, in so-called hardware description languages, or HDLs. Uh, HDL, uh, HDLs are used to describe uh, uh, systems comprised of hardware. And we use uh, the discrete event model there in particular if we are talking about digital hardware. For analog hardware, we are typically using other models. So if we talk about digital hardware, you, we are using uh, these uh, HDLs that are based on discrete event modeling. One of the key requirements for such uh, models is that we need to be able to describe uh, concurrency because if we have a real hardware system, we have uh, different subsystems that are operating concurrently and our simulation model must include this concurrent operation. Now, when we do uh, simulations based on hardware description languages, we are typically simulating uh, in a way which is pretty close to software, and therefore we have to map these uh, concurrent operations to some kind of uh, software, and what we typically do there is we map this concurrent operation uh, to processes. And these processes would then communicate uh, via signals, and these signals correspond to the wires that we have in real hardware. There are many different hardware description languages. Uh, hardware description languages became very popular in the 1970s, more or less. And uh, one of them uh, is uh, the language called Mimular. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to report that I was uh, involved in the design of that language called Mimula, together with uh, my former advisor, Ger Gerhard Zimmermann. Since then, quite a number of languages have been proposed that have uh, specific advantages or specific features. Uh, the three um, most commonly used hardware description languages are uh, VHDL, uh, Verilog and System C. So these are three languages that are uh, very frequently used these days, and they are all based on the discrete event model. Now we will use VHDL as an example to demonstrate some of the underlying mechanisms for hardware description languages and for discrete event models. Now VHDL is an acronym. What does it stand for? VHDL stands for VISIC Hardware Description Language, which means that there is another acronym. What does uh, VISIC stand for? VISIC stands for Very High Speed Integrated Circuit. Uh, the VISIC program was a program by the American Department of Defense, uh, where the uh, DOD was trying to improve uh, the uh, state of the art regarding its uh, weapons. In 1980, uh, the Department of Defense started the definition of a hardware description language. Uh, the DOD had already standardized a language for the description of software called ADA, and therefore there was the idea that this hardware description language should in one way or the other be similar to, to ADA. Now the execution semantics turns out to be different, but the syntax at least is in, in one way or the other a little similar. And since ADAR in turn is based on Pascal, the syntactic sugar that we are using there for VHDL is also a little bit like Pascal. Later, that language became publicly available. It became an IEEE standard called uh, IEEE Standard 1076 that was uh, standardized in 1987. Uh, IEEE requires all these standards to be reconsidered every five years, so there was a revision published in 1992. And uh, since then, there were a couple of revisions and extensions. Most notably, there was one extension in 1999 where the capability to also model analog systems was uh, added as an optional extension there. Uh, this may be interesting in the context of cyber physical systems, 
uh, because if we really want to model physical systems, uh, we need to be able to model, for example, partial differential equations, and that is possible with the VHDL AMS. And then in 2006, major other extensions were added, some initial restrictions were removed. Next, I'd like uh, to demonstrate how we can use uh, VHDL in order to model hardware. And uh, for this demonstration, I'd like uh, to use uh, two cross-connected NOR gates. With these uh, two cross-connected NOR gates, I'd like to demonstrate how we can compute uh, the output at a little circuit uh, as a function of its input if we assume that uh, there is uh, a discrete event model. So in this case, we assume that we have uh, two cross-connected uh, uh, NOR gates. Those of you who had some introduction to digital circuits might recognize that this is just a simple flip-flop. And we will demonstrate how we are able to simulate such a very simple flip-flop. We assume that uh, initially uh, we, we start with uh, uh, values of uh, zero at the uh, two inputs over here. So for times less than zero, we assume that uh, these uh, uh, values are both zero. And we also assume that we have certain outputs that are available at uh, these uh, two NOR gates there. We assume that the outputs are zero and one. And we can verify that this is uh, indeed a stable, consistent state because this one will generate a zero there at the output there. And with two zeros, we will be generating a one there. Now we assume uh, that at uh, uh, t equals zero, uh, we will uh, change the inputs in such a way that we keep the zero there, but we change that one to a one. So that should be a one. Now, this means that we have a change there at the input of this uh, NOR gate, and therefore we need to reevaluate the behavior of that NOR gate. So we see an input of, of one there for, for one of the two inputs of the NOR gate. Therefore, as a result, there should be a new value of uh, zero. Now, this new value will not be immediately assigned, but this is part of the future of that specific uh, signal. So we will uh, allocate such a transition to the queue. That means we will generate an entry there in the queue, uh, which will uh, then a little later on uh, generate such a zero. But initially, in order to make this consistent, before we actually have uh, this propagation of the new value, we will continue to have uh, the, the old value over here. So before this uh, new value gets assigned, we will still have uh, the old value there. That means at the time where we have this transition, we still have these old values there. But then at the time when we fetch this entry there from the queue, uh, we will have to perform the action that is listed there in the entry. And this uh, means that there will be a zero generated there. At that time, at the time when we generate the zero, these uh, values at the input, they will remain there. And also this value will remain there. Now over here we have a new value, which means that we need to reevaluate uh, the local behavior of that NOR gate. And uh, in this case, we will have uh, two zeros there, which means that the new output uh, should be uh, a one. So we will uh, generate a one um, in uh, this entry in uh, the uh, list of uh, future values. And a little later on, we will fetch uh, the earliest of the entries there in the queue. And we will perform the assignment that's indicated there in the queue. And that means we will assign a 1 there. Uh, at the time when we assign the 1, nothing has changed over here. Nothing has changed over here. And nothing has changed over there. So as a result, we will get a new value there at the input. And at this input, we will now have uh, two ones, which means that the new value will be a zero. We will be generating an entry there in the queue, which will then a little later on also generate a zero there at the output. Uh, and uh, at the time when we generate the zero there, nothing will have uh, changed for, for the other values. That means this will remain the same, that will remain the same, and that will remain the same. And this zero is not really 
providing any new value there uh, to that input of this process. So the whole uh, evaluation procedure will terminate because there is new no new value to the inputs of this process. And that means we will terminate our evaluations here. So that was a specific example. If we try uh, to generalize the particular example, we can state the following. Uh, the uh, processes will wait for changes at their inputs. So they're kind of sitting there waiting for changes at their inputs. If they arrive, these uh, processes will wake up, uh, compute their code, and uh, deposit changes uh, of output signals in the event queue and wait for the next event. And if all these processes wait, we will fetch the next entry there from the event queue. That is exactly how I was describing that particular example. Now, in the case that I indicated on the slide just shown, we had uh, descriptions of these uh, NOR gates using processes uh, where I didn't uh, explicitly indicate how long it will take until we assign these new values. We will see that, uh, in general, this may be a little different. So if we look at the code of these uh, processes, we see over here, uh, first of all, that there is uh, one operator, which uh, may be an operator that you don't know so far. Uh, this is a kind of assignment operator, but it's different from the standard variable assignment in that this is a so-called signal assignment operator. The signal assignment operator works a little different from the value assignment operator, from the uh, operator that assigns new values to variables, in that we first compute uh, the value of the expression on the right-hand side. And uh, once we know the values of this expression, we will generate an entry there uh, to uh, our predicted future. This predicted future is called the projected waveform for a particular signal. We will add uh, the new value there to the entries that we have uh, for uh, this predicted future. And uh, then, whenever uh, no uh, new uh, expression needs to be computed, we will pick uh, the first entry there from, from the queue and perform the function which is indicated. Now we see that in general, uh, these uh, assignments, uh, these uh, statements, may include a so-called delay clause, which means that uh, these assignments, assignments will not become effective, but they will become ef not effective immediately, but they will become effective after a certain delay time, and it's that time which is indicated there. Uh, also, uh, in this description of these uh, processes, we might uh, get the wrong conclusion that we are evaluating these uh, bodies only once and then we are done. However, in this case, we are describing hardware which uh, keeps uh, 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 executing all the time and therefore we implicitly assume that there is an infinite loop around this code. That means whenever we have reached the end of this code, we start all over again right from the beginning. So there is this implicit loop around the code and the body. And then we need to figure out at what point in time do we need to evaluate the body of these uh, processes. And uh, the rule is that we re-evaluate re or that we start these processes when uh, one of the signals that is included in uh, this so-called sensitivity list is changing, uh, where this notation is the equivalent of the notation that you see down here. Uh, the equivalent notation is to have a so-called wait statement at the uh, very end of this loop body. That means initially we will execute this uh, process and uh, then uh, we wait there until either A or B are changing. And since uh, then, when uh, we will be woken up by one of the changes, uh, we will be starting all over again. So that's the execution semantics for uh, these uh, processes. Now, this was a little uh, example, or rather small example. Next, I can provide you with a somewhat larger example where we can also see how we can use this uh, for uh, getting some impression of what our circuit is actually doing. 
As an example, I'm using a full adder where we have uh, three input ports and uh, two output ports. In VHDL, such a full adder is called an entity. This entity has uh, three input ports called A, B, and carry in. They are definitely input ports and they are of type uh, bit. And we have these two output ports, which are called uh, sum and carry out, and they are again of type bit. So that is our kind of header description of the entity. And then we also uh, describe the local uh, behavior of uh, that entity. We could also describe the structure of that entity. In this case, we describe the behavior of the entity. Uh, we make sure that the system understands to which header uh, this uh, description of the behavior is belonging. And then we have the local description of the behavior, which uh, is uh, describing the computations that we need for uh, performing uh, the operation, uh, operations expected from a full header. And in this case, we see that the delay in both cases is assumed to be 10 nanoseconds. Then I can show you what would be the result in case that we use a simulator there. So if we use a simulator, we can see that uh, 10 nanoseconds after this uh, change at the input, we will have the corresponding change at the output. So you can see that in this way, we can actually uh, see uh, the impact of uh, these uh, uh, delay statements. And I think it's uh, possible to understand that in this way, uh, we can model the real delays that are uh, present in actual circuits. Now, these were examples. Um, in this lecture, I will not introduce the full syntax of VHDL because this is not a VHDL course. It's not a hardware design course, but the main purpose is to use VHDL in, in order to improve uh, the understanding of the uh, discrete event uh, simulation semantics. So therefore, I will immediately move towards a description of the semantics of uh, VHDL. And I found that the only reasonable way for really explaining the semantics is by introducing you to a subset of the text that is there in the original standards document, because any attempt to simplify this uh, results in rather invalid uh, simplifications. So we will use a subset there from the description of the semantics in the uh, language uh, manual. So according to that uh, description, according to the VHDL standards document, the execution of a model consists of an initialization phase followed by the repeated execution of process statements in the description of that model and the initialization phase will execute each uh, process exactly once. So this is what the manual states about initialization. At the beginning of uh, the execution of a model, we will first of all uh, assign uh, the uh, variable keeping track of the current time uh, to a time of uh, zero nanoseconds. TC stands for the current time. And then the next thing is to compute the effective value of all explicitly declared uh, signals. In VHDL, we can initialize all the variables and all the signals. So in this case, this means that we will compute the values uh, that need to be initialized for uh, each of these uh, uh, signals that we're using there in, in the model. The effective value refers to the fact that actually there can be several sources that provide input to, to the value of a signal. So therefore, we need to compute the so-called effective value. So that's the first thing that uh, we need to do. And we will assign these uh, new uh, values to uh, all uh, the signals. The next thing to do in this uh, initialization phase is then to execute uh, each uh, process until its expense. So we will activate all the processes. There are a few exceptions. There are some processes that are exempted from this execution, but usually all the uh, processes are, are executed. So then uh, we will uh, evaluate these uh, processes. That means we will execute the body of uh, these uh, processes. And as a result of that, we will uh, obtain new values for the signals, which we will store as the future of, of the signals. Uh, 
The future of the signals is uh, stored in so-called signal drivers. Which this, these are the inputs that we are considering when we compute the effective values for, for signals. The next step then is to figure out at which time uh, we need to do the next simulation. There might be a certain time during which we don't have to do anything. Uh, so we have to figure out what is the next uh, uh, time at which we have to perform simulation. And this is the earliest among all the times at which you might have to do something. And this uh, computation is described in a little more detail a little later on. So there is a, a step uh, F uh, that will uh, provide the details on how to compute that time. So that is the initialization. Now, uh, at this time, uh, we are about to complete the first iteration of this uh, simulation loop. And it, at this time, we have to check whether this is the end of the simulation. It's rather unlikely since we are just uh, leaving initialization. But uh, uh, to be sure, we really need to uh, check whether we would possibly have to leave simulation there. We can leave simulation for several reasons. If uh, we have reached uh, the upper bound of uh, the range of times that we are considering. And if uh, nothing else uh, needs to be done, that means uh, there are no entries there in our queue of uh, future events that we should uh, consider, uh, then we exit from, from the simulation. Otherwise, we set uh, the current time to what we computed as the next uh, simulation time. And this means that if the uh, operations that we performed so far consist of initializations, this means that we will now uh, start to work on the very first iteration. Now, in the very first iteration, and uh, the same applies also to, to all uh, later iterations, uh, we will uh, uh, check which uh, we will first of all uh, assign new values uh, to the signal. So if, as a result of this initialization, we have to assign new values, uh, we will do this. Uh, and as a result of this, there might be signals that have uh, changed their values. And if, as a result, there are signals that have changed their values, we have to activate all the processes uh, for which inputs have changed. So we will consider at this uh, step D, uh, all the signals for which we have uh, changed the values. Uh, we will consider all the processes and we will consider whether or not a certain process is sensitive uh, to a signal where we found a changed value. And if we find such a process, then that uh, process is, is activated. In total, this means all these processes that are sensitive to signal changes are activated. Uh, they would then be executed. That means we evaluate the body of the code. Uh, we will uh, generate uh, future values for uh, these uh, signals. And we would again uh, compute the next time at which we have to perform a simulation. So this next time is the earliest among the following three candidates. Uh, one of the candidates is the uh, upper bound on the time ranges that we have to consider. Uh, the second candidate is the next time at which a driver becomes active. That means the, the next time at which uh, we would uh, possibly need to assign a new value to a signal. And the third candidate is provided by uh, the list of uh, four statements. We can delay processes for a particular amount of time. And it might happen that the time indicated there actually leads to uh, the uh, smallest uh, future time at which we have to perform a simulation. So these are the three candidates for forming the uh, earliest of, uh, the, uh, of, these time, of this time. So, and uh, it could happen that then the next time that we compute in this way is actually the same as the current time. This happens, for example, in this little uh, example that I demonstrated for uh, this flip-flop. We did not indicate any time, so therefore uh, the next times are the same as the current times, which means that we are not really advancing macro macroscopic times. 
And if we are not advancing macroscopic times, we are calling this a delta cycle. And a delta, delta cycle means that in between any two macroscopic times, we can have an arbitrary number of delta cycles. So these are the cycles that we have observed uh, for our delayless model of the uh, flip-flop. Uh, we have seen that there we needed three such uh, delta cycles. That means we have three such uh, small cycles before we can finally consider the next uh, macroscopic time instant. Uh, it is indeed possible to have some problems arising from uh, the use of uh, these uh, delta cycles. We can indeed have an unlimited number of delta cycles in between any two macroscopic times. So for example, if we have hardware which is just oscillating, we will have such an unlimited number of delta cycles. So let's assume that initially, for example, we generate a one there, and then we what was uh, uh, a delay of one delta cycle generate a zero there. With another delay of one delta cycle, we would generate a one there. With a delay of one delta cycle, we would generate a zero there, uh, which means that we have to consider the, the zero also at this input, which means that we have to change that into a one, we have to change that into zero, etc. So this will continue on forever, which means that we have an infinite loop, and in this infinite loop, we will not even advance macroscopic time. Yeah? Which is why I put this ghost there. Because if that happens to you as a designer, you might be really bored. Because you start your simulator and it does not terminate. And you might even look at the current time at which the simulator is, is simulating and you will see no advancement of the current time. And then you have to figure out, well, where did I have, uh, where did I build some infinite loop into my model? And it may not be as easy to detect as in this case. Okay, so if these delta cycles are a potential problem, what are they used for then? Well, they are used for this uh, flip-flop as uh, shown earlier on uh, one of the earliest slides. And there you saw that initially we started uh, with these uh, two inputs being uh, zero. And then I assume that at uh, uh, zero nanoseconds, we will uh, change this input to one. And therefore, uh, with a delay of one nanosecond, we will have uh, the new output there uh, at this output Q. With a delay of two uh, delta cycles, uh, we will have uh, the, the output there at this other uh, output of the flip-flop. And with a delay of three delta cycles, uh, we will have a stable situation. So we see that these delta cycles do make uh, some sense in our simulation. Uh, these delta cycles somehow reflect the fact that no real circuit comes with uh, zero delay, with a real zero delay, because there is always a little delay involved. However, we could ask the question whether we should really allow delayless models in uh, such uh, systems, because these delayless models are uh, resulting in some, in some uh, uh, complications. These delayless models are the reason why we possibly have uh, these infinite loops without actually advancing uh, the time. But if we would require designers to always put a delay there, uh, then we would ask the designers to put some delay there which they might not know. So we would force them to specify something that they don't know, and therefore this is a little inconvenient, and therefore uh, we are providing, or the designers of VHDL are providing uh, this uh, way of uh, specifying models without specifying delays. Okay, in uh, this execution semantics of VHDL, uh, we have used a separation between the computation of new values for expressions and the actual assignments, which means that we have es done essentially the same thing that we also did for, spa for statemate, and we did this in order to provide a, a determinate uh, simulation semantics. And for the very same reason, we are having this separation over here as well. In order to have a determinate simulation of hardware circuits, uh, we are using this uh, simulation here. 
Again, it's very useful. It would be very inconvenient for designers if uh, two simulation results could differ and uh, still both of them could be correct. We are trying to avoid that. 